Donald Trump described entrepreneurship as being a fine artist. Now you start out with a canvas, a blank canvas, and then you paint your vision. But unlike a fine artist, an entrepreneur has to, he spends his waking hours actually, selling his vision, his paintings to the world to the extent that he can sell this vision or his visions is to the extent that he can achieve great success. My next two guests have achieved spectacular success and uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to have them here on Groundbreakers. Welcome to the show, Harry Stinson, Jack Berkowitz. Good well, to see you guys. Well, Thank you. Here. Thank you. Good to see you guys. So, you know, let's get right into this. I mean, we're in Canada. Every country has certain constructs, certain limitations. Um, you know, it's, and a lot of people say being an entrepreneur in Canada is a very tough line to toe for, you know, for many obvious reasons. How have you found it to be an entrepreneur in Canada? In other words, Jack, what are the limitations of being an entrepreneur in Canada? Well, firstly, I think that limitations are for losers. Limitations are for people who won't make it, can't make it, and need an excuse, something to, to, to rely on yeah. to explain their failures away. We have one real limitation in Canada, and that's the lack of banks. Uh, so financing is a big issue. One thing that is quite problematic in Canada is this concept of recovery. In the States, you know, it's expected that an entrepreneur tries, you fall behind, you try again, you try again, and they expect you to try again, that's acceptable. In Canada, it's more, okay, he tried, it failed, so there you go, there, that, that's it, too well, bad. Well, I don't know if that's a perspective that you have from the consumer, from the average uh, member of the public. Or, or from the banks and lenders. Banks. Well, that's exactly, that is the yes. major limitation of this country. But you, you just, wait a second, a minute ago, you said there was no limitation. I said, now, if there is one, banks. if there is one, it's <laughs> banks, and that is, there is only, only one bank in this country. There are five banks with a minor little player on the side, Schedule B banks are not allowed to lend of any significant amounts of money. If you want to borrow $10 million in this, in this country, you've got to go outside the country and they won't lend in Canada. The banks are one here. And the reason we talk about this incredible strength of banks is because they, their, their lending criteria is so restrictive that of course they're going to be strong, especially when you don't allow them competition. That is the only significant problem we have for entrepreneurs in this country. Beyond that, there's nothing significant. Taxes, pay your taxes. Or don't pay your taxes and run a criminal organization. We're very lenient on crime. No, I, I think he's fundamentally right, but I do think there is a real Canadian hang up with failing publicly. You just don't want to do that. So the Canadian society in general is safe. It's stable. As a great, it is a great country to live in. But if you want to shoot for the stars, there are limitations. And most Canadians who become stars or well-known, okay, Canadian-born, but they're living in Hollywood. They're living in New York. My, yeah, look, okay, from my experience, it seems like if you come up with a really novel, fresh, trailblazing idea, it's almost resented here in Canada. Okay, let's say God, and we fundamentally we all believe there's a God. You know, you, you, we right. Absolutely. He's watching you all the time, Jack. Absolutely. You know, he's watching you. He is. He is. Twenty four seven. Twenty four seven. And he likes you, by the way. Here, he likes you very much. I hope so. And let's say, work with me here. Let's say he comes to you, and he says, Berkowitz, I'm watching you. Uh, I think you're a great entrepreneur. You got this. You know, this vi these great visions. I want you to genetically engineer the perfect entrepreneur, what are the five main characteristics that you're putting into that test tube? The five, so we're talking the ideal portrait of, of the ideal entrepreneur. Well, interesting, because God does not like people who have chutzpah. Nevertheless, we are amkshe orif, which is a stiff-necked people. We're stubborn. We don't take no for an answer. And I think that's the prime prerequisite is, is not taking no for an answer. The ability to say yes no matter what. It's this chutzpah. It's this cholom yekes, call it what you will. But it's the ability to say, I will still pursue my dream and I will get it done. Never take no for that's an answer. Why. That's number one. Of course, you've got to have the talent or the vision. You've got to be able to come up with the item that you mm -hmm. need to make. You've got to be able to sell it. You know, even a great doctor will never achieve greatness if he can't sell himself. Salesmanship. Salesmanship. Just number three. Just number for those three. keeping track of this, of this genetically engineered perfect entrepreneur. Now we need two more, Jack. 
you need to have faith in the product. So right. it's not enough to sell something that you don't believe in. You've got to have faith in yourself, faith in what you're selling, faith in the concept, be it a building, a community, a structure, or be it a piece of jewelry for a great price and a great design, and the fact that this will sell, notwithstanding all the naysayers. Fair enough. Number five, Jack? I don't think you need five, but if I had to, to come up with a, a number five, I, I think it's a belief in God. You know, both you guys have been involved in soap opera sagas uh, in your own respective careers. Now, Jack, you actually, you know, get a, a cold, hard death threat as you're walking, you know, meandering through life, trying to mind your own business, and somebody comes up to you and says, I want to kill you, and I was hired to kill you. Harry, you've had some really, really stressful moments over the years as well that but I'm not sure if it ranks right up there with a moment like that. But I'm going to ask you guys, how do you, because this, is, this, is, this really does deserve a few moments of time, how do you weather the, stress, the ongoing stress? And how did you get through that incident? I don't know if you want to clarify, without any mentioning names, that incident, because uh, I think we should. It's before the courts right now, so I can't really speak about it in great detail. And there's just, many, many lawsuits. Just, just, just give the synopsis. Well, um, I, I'm, I've been a jewelry retailer or manufacturer for the good part of my life. Um, that's after being a rabbi and a CPA and a, a talk show host and, and many other things. But my, my, real, my real, the bane of my existence, the reason I exist right now is because I'm a jewelry retailer. Um, some other retailer who spends all his time buying gold, yeah. as opposed to my business, which is selling gold, took exception to the fact that I chose to sell, to, to buy gold as well. Yeah, yeah. And his way of dealing with the competition, uh, as per my allegations, are that he felt I should be somehow set aside as a competitor. Um, and so I walked yeah. in, walked into my, one of my stores one day, there was a man allegedly waiting for me, or he had an appointment with me, he claimed, and I didn't know who he was. And uh, he then proceeded to tell me that uh, I'm, I'm shortening the whole saga because. Yeah, yeah. We, but uh, he ba basically said that he was hired to kill me. And okay, so what are you thinking at a moment like that? Well, what's the, going the, the first your mind? thing that's going through your mind while your knees are buckling, and and while you're panting for breath, you're really saying this can't be true. It's a joke. It's got to be a joke because all I do is buy jewelry and sell jewelry. Why would anybody want to kill me for that? So I, I took it to be not real and I went to the police, told them the story. They took it from there and they found that there was enough veracity in the story that they, they laid charges. Important to note, because we are broadcasting here, that these are still allegations and nothing has been proven in the court of law. Well, I, worse than that, they actually dropped the charges they for reasons it. that they would not tell me, but uh, I, okay. I, I suspect that there are significant reasons. Okay, repercussions of that for you. You told me the other day you're wearing a heart monitor now. I mean. What are the repercussions? The repercussions that your life changes forever. Uh, you start. How so? How so? For one, the good side of it all is that you start to value your family and friends. Right, right. You know, right. you start to value the fresh air and the sunshine, right. because you st you keep looking back to that moment and say it could have been the end. Right, so all of a sudden, right. every day takes on significant new significance, and your lo loved ones become very very important to you. Having said that, you don't step out of a building at night without looking over your shoulder all the time. So. Um, your, your life. So it's on your mind 24 7 it still? Never it's, go, it's never, never goes it, away. Do you think it's going to go away? It will never go away. It never go away. No. So it's a moment that changed your life, and your life will never be the same. My life will never be the same. And that is the price. Forget, forget the literally close to a million dollars in legal fees, yeah, yeah. which keep on, on going. And we haven't yet reached the first day of discoveries. I mean, it's now four years, and we can't you know seem what? to get anywhere. Sorry, I'm going to get to Harry in a second, but I have a really interesting question because you are a man of God. You are, you're a rabbi. But a lot of people don't know that. How do you, how do you reach a point of, of true forgiveness for a moment like that, which is a pretty ugly, nasty moment? Forgiveness of the perpetrator? Forgiveness, the other, well... For, forgive God? Well, look at Forgive the perpetrator, and if we are spiritual individuals on a higher level, how do we forgive God? Well, we, we can't ask questions of God. My parents are Holocaust survivors, and they didn't ask questions of God, so I'm certainly not going to ask questions of God. Will you forgive this individual? Never. Never? Never. Do you have any interaction with him at all? Do you ever bump into him in the community? Um, my week is ruined every time I sight a glimpse of him. Ah, so, yeah, sorry, so I, sorry I, about that. I, I will never forgive him. Sorry about that. Harry, let's get to you. Um, you weathered a very, very public storm with David Mervish. We don't have you know a huge amount of time, but this was an epic battle 
uh, millions of dollars in legal fees. The emotional devastation was unbelievable because you and I have talked about this over the years. You've had your own trials and tribulations and your own storms, and the fact that you're still standing here is quite a testament to your, to your constitution. But I want to give you a crack at that question, is how do you, how do you keep standing? Well, I, I think the health aspect is one, but, uh, and I haven't had as devastating a threat as a death threat. But when you realize that the concept of the justice system, that you know, justice will prevail and if all else fails, you can go for, you know. Not true. It's not true. It is a legal industry. And the moment you can't feed that legal industry, you're on your own very much on your own and it, it is not dissimilar I this is sound exaggeration but it's not dissimilar to going into the police station in Russia and saying Vladimir Putin threatened me it's like a but we're in Canada it's not supposed it, to be it, that way it's just but more it formal is. yeah it is when you had interaction with authorities the police and, and so on uh, you do find out that justice is not for everybody <laughs> Harry Stinson, you know, real estate visionary, teams up with, and he is a mogul, we can safely say that, right? Toronto mogul David Mervish. Yes. And it's the, like the odd couple. You got, it's, it, you couldn't have scripted this any better. You got, you got two unlikely characters working together and cuts, I don't know how many years later, this man is on the verge of being escorted out of the building that he developed putting in thousands of hours into developing this huge skyscraper. So I'm wondering if you could take us through as quick as possible where this marriage, this business relationship broke down. Well, it is a short time allowance. And as I mentioned, I warned you before, don't get me started on no, this. No, no. But, but essentially but where it broke down is I think when the lawyers saw the, the classic opportunity for a dispute on which they could pour gasoline, and one of the parties was very, very deep pockets. So this could be lucrative. And I don't think that had it been left to David and myself sitting in a coffee shop, this couldn't have been worked out. But it got way out of hand. And it wasn't out of hand over, over a personal dispute. It was out of hand, actually, over a deficiency lawsuit with regard to the building. So you, build this, so you develop this amazing condominium hotel and there's a deficiency lawsuit with the condo owner saying certain things were not delivered, correct? That's correct. Now, $30 million it, it becomes a question of where does the blame go? Who's the fall guy? There's always got to be a fall guy. Well, I was sort of thrown out with the bathwater on that. But, you know, as Jack has said, it's before the courts. Mine never got before the courts. There Why was not? a massive... Well, because I ran out of money before I could get it before the courts. Right. And that was known by all parties, including the lawyers. Right. So when you have an army on one side right. and you're sort of standing alone on the other side, it doesn't take very long to figure out. And the judges know this. They would rather not have to rule on something. So if they know what the outcome is going to be, all you have to do is just stall it out long enough until one of the parties just slides out of that. court. You know, <laughs> And that's an easy way to deal yeah, with it. Justice is for the rich. Uh, no so how did you? So how does an entrepreneur protect a good idea? It's very hard to protect intellectual property mm -hmm. unless you're ruthless about it with lawyers. Um, but the property itself needs to be an interesting. Well, actually, idea. I did. Well, I did the opposite. I, I the, the reason I was able to have Canada compete successfully with the rest of the world in jewelry manufacturing is we are limited in Canada with skilled labor. We don't have setters, diamond setters, and gem setters, and so on. It takes a lot of time to set a stone mm -hmm. to set it properly. Berkowitz says, well, why don't we reverse the process? And I totally reverse the process so that now any unskilled laborer within a day could set 10,000 stones a day, which is 100 times greater than anybody in China could set. So what did I do? Absolutely nothing. Rather than go and patent this idea, which was at that time the most revolutionary idea in jewelry manufacturing 25 years ago, I decided to keep the process a secret and do it on the fifth floor of a, an industrial building or commercial building. Well, my employees would fan out across the world and go work elsewhere and took the idea with them. So within five years, I was competing with the rest of the world on my idea. So my choice of protecting the process yeah, saying, yeah. 
It was a bad idea. I could have done what Harry's saying, and that is protected intellectually through lawyers. I chose not to go that route. Why? Either, Why? Because I thought it would be safer. Once you apply for a patent, you've got to disclose the patent, right, right. the process, right. right? And I said, I'm not disclosing the process. I'll keep it a secret. So I am, I am now responsible for about 98% of the world's jewelry manufacturing right, with right. my process. Right, right. But so I, I guess no that answers my question. There is no protecting there really a really, a really good idea. You can't legally or practically protect you can't it. Enforce if you think it. you've got this <clears throat> idea and I'm good for the rest of my life, forget it. I mean, pharmaceutical companies can't protect their patents. For 17 years. You just have to keep yeah. moving. So the idea is then. In theory. So then the idea is as soon as copy it Korea. <laughs> the idea then, as soon as you get this amazing, you know, brainstorm, get out there, get it done as quick as Look you can. Look for the next one. Microsoft but, but, had that problem. They did not think ahead. They thought they could coast on their. They're now catching up. McDonald's. Any corporation that starts to coast thinks we're good, we're fine. Just keep doing it again. You know, one of the things that Canadian banks, getting back to that issue, Canadian banks will never allow you to meet their credit committee. There isn't a credit committee. <laughs> there actually is <laughs> downtown. They're anonymous. You, no one ever gets have to you meet ever, them. You, you never no, met No, never met one. No, no. You ne you're not allowed to. The banks yeah. have a rule. You cannot meet the credit committee because you know not why? Yeah. Do you know why? Not you might actually have an idea that you can sell to them. They don't want to be sold. They want to go by numbers. You know, so you cannot ever take the passion, the, the incredible endurance, the incredible belief that you have for a project or for a, for a purpose and sell it to them. So they, they take no risks ever. That's you the know, problem. and the, the stupid part about that is you cannot fake passion. You can see through that. You can of fake course. numbers so easily. You Absolutely. can create this fancy report. You can and get an accounting firm to say anything. Most decisions of great magnitude should be based on the person who's pitching it to you. You got to look the guy in the face. I like what he's got to say, and I like who's saying it. Put That's him in the hot part seat. of the part of the variable. It's a major variable. Banks don't want to know about that. In Canada, you'll never ever get to meet a credit committee. I heard they're dining at, at Omni once in a while there. Yeah. You know, they're grabbing the pancakes, <coughs> and that's how you might grab it. I really don't think there is one. I think it's, it's a sham that they just say that there's this credit exist? committee. doesn't really is exist. It a, or is it this just a, uh, you it's, know? It's a myth. myth. The, 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 the it's the like the Wizard of Oz. Behind the, the, that the, curtain, there's this there's phony little guy who's <coughs> like, oh, no, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> My job well, is to say that, no. Hey, maybe that could be the next movie, the next documentary. Finding be a good movie. The Finding the credit committee. Finding the credit committee. Get Michael Moore up here. Now listen, Harry, if you could go back and talk to Harry Stinson, knowing what you do now, I don't know, how, how old are you? 61. 61. You don't look a day older than 60, honest to God. Honest to God, it's you don't. It's the pills at the Honest to God, you don't. 70 flights. Yeah. <laughs> if you could go back at 60 years old, if you could go back and talk to Harry Stinson, that, you know, wet behind the ears, 29-year-old, what would your advice be? 17 when I started. Okay. Hey, what's a few years between friends? We, 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 now you know it's a Jewish show because we're arguing about absolutely nothing. <laughs> uh, no, we're not. Uh, <laughs> the ratings uh, will soar. The ratings will soar. Let's keep arguing. You, can we, I'm sure we can. Last night we did uh, for a few, few hours. But, but, but all kidding aside, Harry, I mean, you have the opportunity to go back in time, to travel back in time. What do you say? What is your advice? to a 17-year-old Harry Stinson when you say, hey, fella, this is what you need to know to succeed in the world of entrepreneurship. I would have spent a little more time on the financing side of it. I just assumed that my great idea would somehow attract right. support. Right. Um, and so I got consumed with executing the idea a little earlier than perhaps I should have. Right. Uh, and right. more so with the development side. I probably, I spent a decade in restaurants, which is exhausting. <coughs> and as much as I love restaurants, I should have got into real estate right away because I've always loved the real estate part. But I thought yeah. it's too big for me. Right, right. But I think I probably would have done a little bit of apprenticeship at a major developer. So your advice would be? Really get to know the industry a little bit better and build your relationships. I just jumped right in and thought my idea was enough. <coughs> okay, so, so, product, so industry knowledge, R&D. Essentially. Yeah, although ironically, perhaps if I'd got into the industry, maybe I would have drank the Kool-Aid and, and thought, well, you know, they're right that these people are older and wiser than I. You can get sucked sideways. There's a lot, of, I, I think back to the movie Big, 
Yeah, yeah. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, where yeah, you know yeah. the, the little kid becomes an adult and, and has, as he changes from being a little kid in his mind to becoming an adult, he becomes progressively more useless to the company that hired him right, because he's right, supposedly right. a free right. thinker. Right, right. Because he has to then toe the, toe the line. I, I, I'm, I'm internally conflicted. Um, uh, your question is a great question, and I've never Thank given Thank you very it, much. Never First time you've complimented me, and in the 20 years I've known you. So today, were I, were I reborn, were I 17 years old, I would ask myself, do I want to do something I truly love, okay. or would I go into fields that I know I have no limits, and that's real estate okay. and selling of money, mortgages, financings, uh, uh, any form of putting out money. I do believe those are the only two industries in the world, and they will be there forever. People always need a place to live. People always need money to pay the rent. The second issue I have is far more troubling for me, and that is the issue of ethics and morals. I run my life the way I think everybody should in business, and that is you always do the right thing. You make a bad deal, you don't get out of it. You honor the deal. You shake hands, you live with that, no matter how stupid it turns out that that decision was. The people I've met on the other side of the table, for the most part, and there's no limit, those are the Jewish people, the Indians, the Chinese, the Israelis, the Middle Eastern. We want to make sure we offend everybody we here. Offend we everyone. don't want to leave anybody it out. It seems okay to not honor your deal. So I'm at a disadvantage, and I'm not patting myself on the back, I'm telling you I'm stupid. Uh, but when you are a person who will on, always honor your deal for, for better or worse, and the other side does not, you have a tremendous disability or disadvantage. I would count, I would, if I were to lead my life again, I would wrestle with this issue. Do I want to be honest about my taxes? Do I want to be honest with the police? Do I want to be honest with the CRA and with all regulatory bodies out there? I always have been. And I'm proud of that and I sleep well at night. But if you think I have less problems with the CRA than some crook, if you think I have less problems with the police than some crook, if you think I have less problems with, with, with any regulatory bodies than some criminal, I do not. So the system does not reward the guy who shakes hands and lives by that. Having said all that, what do I do about it? I'm not, I am who I am. But I would certainly tell my children, you know, there's gray. Take advantage of the gray. So, you're, so getting back to the question, your advice essentially would be? Be careful about your decisions because they will haunt you forever. So sleeping well at night is not the end all and be all necessarily. I'm not saying to go that route. I'm saying consider it seriously. Consider it seriously. Being honest may make you sleep well and they have a great suite for your corner suite in the world to come. But it seems that other people think they have suites too and they're not living by the same rules. So how do you fix that? That's, I don't have an answer to that, but it's a problem. I'm not entirely agreeing with that, but I would fundamentally agree with the point that if you assume that life is fair and justice will prevail and being a good person is enough. So what don't toast. you agree with? What part of what I said do you Well, I think with? that the, the sense of there's gray area, yes, there are gray areas. I wouldn't say that that would mean compromise what you're going to do, but don't assume that somehow doing the right thing is enough. Just you think and to become you. slightly Oliver Stoneish. Assume that there is, that you're going to get screwed no matter what you do. So you okay, guys, all joking aside, it's been an absolute pleasure to sit in, in kibitz and talk about the inner facets of entrepreneurship. Lots of amazing insights for the young entrepreneurs who I know are you know, very eager to tap into your infinite wisdom. So it's been a pleasure. Jack Berkowitz, awesome to see you again. Thank you I always love to you. talk to you. Harry Stinson. Thank you. Thanks for showing up. And we're going to wrap it up, the first episode of Groundbreakers Inside the Minds of Canada's Greatest Entrepreneurs. Thanks for being here. See you next time. Same time, same channel. Thanks for being here.